we're crime team investigators in the United States, and um, I've been doing this about 27 years, and Holly's been doing this. I've only been doing this for about a year, but the agency I work for back in Atlanta in the States, which is in Georgia, um, we have the highest homicide rate in Georgia. So I'm getting a ton of experience in a very short amount of time. Last year we had um, about 96 homicides. So that is quite crazy compared to some counties only have maybe five a year. Right, so her county, which is an area of Atlanta, had about 96 homicides a year. The county that I worked in last year had about 45 homicides a year. So in, in the United States, we have a lot of violent crime. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that, and we can talk about that. Uh, but what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about kind of the fundamentals of crime scene investigation. What do we do? People watch TV. They watch CSI and Law and & Order and uh, Forensic Files and Bones and what's the other one? Um, the uh, criminal minds, uh, all that kind of stuff. And so that's Hollywood and that's entertaining, but that's not necessarily um, reality. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about reality, what happened to the crime scene. Now I do wanna warn you, there's some photographs we're gonna show you that are actual crime scene photos. So there are dead people and blood and those types of things. So if you're easily offended, um, look down. I'll try to warn you ahead of time. Uh, are you gonna advance for me, Dami? I don't have a remote, so. He's behind you. What's behind me, all right. The left and right on the, on the, yeah. Excellent. Laser pointer is bottom left. Bottom left. Oh, look at that. Man. <laughs> Croatia, man. Man, Croatia, fancy. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, made in China. It's like in America. <laughs> All right, so that's Holly and Jeff, you know who we are. So we're gonna talk about what happened. So how does the initial crime scene happen? Because in, in the movies, the, the crime scene investigators get there and there's nobody there. It's dark and they're walking around with a little blue light shining it and it's all like creepy music in the background. And in reality, that's not how it happens. So we get a call, uh, usually in the middle of the night for some reason. Yes, about 2 a.m. I get woken up a lot. Right, and they'll say we need you to be route, and we go out, put our clothes on, uh, get in our crime scene truck that we drive home to our house. We keep our equipment at our house, mm -hmm. um, and we respond to the crime scene. And so when I get the phone call, there's a couple of things that I want to ask. Why do you need a crime scene specialist? Because um, sometimes they don't need me. If it's like a burglary, someone broke in the house, we might not come, come to that. Um, it just depends on what kind of crime it is. So, uh, but if there's a dead person, we're usually going to go. Um, we're going to talk about special circumstances. Oh yeah, let me go ahead and tell you this now too. I'm not normal. Okay, I know that. You don't have to tell me that later tonight. Okay, um, you, know, you don't have to pull me aside and go, Jeff. You know, you're really not right. I know. I've been doing this 27 years. It makes you not normal. Holly's all shiny and new, but she'll get not normal too. It just takes some time. All right, we're going to talk about special circumstances. We're going to talk a little bit about a warrant. Now, in the United States, and I don't know about Croatian law, but in the United States, a police officer, I just can't walk into somebody's house and start looking for evidence. I have to have a warrant, which is just a piece of paper where I go to the judge, I explain to the judge why I think I should be able to go in the house, and the judge either grants us permission or not. So, is it here too? Okay. Yeah, see, I have an expert on the front row, which is awesome, so I can always refer to my, my local experience person here. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so we always have to talk about that. And then we say, how does somebody secure the scene? Most evidence that gets destroyed in a crime scene gets destroyed by the police. Um, and I, you laugh, but it's true. The first officer on the scene, their job is to protect the scene, to treat anyone who might be injured, uh, to arrest the bad guy if the bad guy's there. So it's uh, their job is not to look at the forensic evidence. So they might flip on a light switch or kick a shell casing. Things, walk through the blood. Yeah, those kind of things. So oftentimes evidence gets damaged by those officers, not intentionally, but because they're doing their job. And then that officer gets the scene secured, and then they'll call for an ambulance if there's an injured person. So then the emergency medical staff comes, and then they open up their medical boxes and get out their medical supplies and leave that stuff laying all over your crime scene. Um, and then the detectives come, and then somewhere along the way they call crime scene. So by the time we get to the scene, a lot has happened usually before we get there. So we try to get them to secure that scene keep anybody out of it that shouldn't be in there. Um, at how we do that, you see on television, they have the yellow crime scene tape, they run around, it says crime scene, do not cross. So we actually use that. All right, these are some of the special circumstances. Uh, is a crime scene at night harder to work one in the daytime? 
Most definitely. And since we get called out a lot at night, we need our flashlights. We need um, just extra light to help light up the scene, especially if we're outside in the woods, which happens a lot. Yeah, sometimes we'll call the fire department and they'll bring out a fire truck with big lights on a pole to help light up our scene. So outdoor scenes require special circumstances. Weather, if I have an outdoor scene and there's blood out in a, in a roadway and it's getting ready to rain like it is here today, then I have to adjust, I have to deal with that evidence quickly or it's going to be destroyed by the weather. So there's lots of special circumstances, so we want to identify those as we're moving along. Uh, multiple scenes. Sometimes you'll get called out and the same perpetrator may have committed multiple crimes. They may have had a domestic dispute and injured a family member and then robbed a store and then shot themselves. And now I have three different scenes that I have to work in one night. Right. That, you experience those? Yes, we usually work in pairs. So my partner and I, we got called out one night and we did have two different scenes. So we had to split up and he was a half mile down the road and it was just me and one detective. So we have to be trained to be able to work scenes by ourselves as well when that happens. So you get lots of that kind of stuff. Multiple victims. If I have multiple dead bodies on a scene, that makes that scene more complicated. It's going to take longer. Um, you never know where you're going to end up in this job. So I got called one day and they said, hey, we need you to go help another crime scene investigator. He's got like five dead bodies in this crime scene. I was like, wow, five bodies, that's a lot. And so I packed up and drove to the crime scene and I came home a month later and we had 349 bodies we recovered from one scene. And uh, this particular scene was a crematory uh, where they were supposed to be cremating bodies for funeral homes. Uh, do you have something like that in Croatia? Okay. Uh, but the owner wasn't cremating bodies. He was just digging big holes in the ground and filing bodies and covering them up with dirt or putting them in buildings. So we ended up with 349 bodies in one scene. So big scene, lots of resources, lots of time. So uh, that's one of the things that's um, about our job that's interesting is you never really know where you're going to go. It's never the same. Uh, but it's also somewhat disturbing at times too. All right, so in America, we have basically three open, we have three search issues. If we have what's called an open field doctrine, if something happens out in an open public space, we don't need a search warrant. We can just go take care of that. If it happens on private property, we can ask the owner to give us permission, we call it consent. And if we get consent to search the scene, we can do that. Um, or we have to go get a search warrant. And then we talk about who writes the search warrant. Uh, in America, you have to be a, an officer. You have to have arrest powers. They wear, wear a gun and a badge to write a search warrant. Um, so we usually have an officer go to the judge, write a warrant to search the property. And then I always say this, read the warrant prior to search. Now that sounds like it would be very, like, you know, yeah, no kidding, we should do that. But oftentimes, the officer writing the warrant might be in another area where the judge is located. We might be out at the scene and they may call us by telephone and say, hey, the warrant's signed, we're ready to go. Well, the warrant specifies what I'm searching for. So if I haven't read the warrant, then I don't know what I'm looking for. So it's very important that I know what's contained on that piece of paper and I read it before I go search the scene. And that doesn't always happen. And when that, when that doesn't happen, that's what leads to evidence getting thrown out in our court system because officers collect things they should not have collected because that wasn't specified in the warrant. Okay, so when we arrive at the scene, the first thing that we're going to do is we go find the case officer or agent or whoever's in charge, and basically I say, well, tell me what happened. Why am I here? And they'll give me a basic rundown of this is why we got called. This, you know, we have a, a dead body, and there were shots fired, and we had a 911 call. Do you guys know what 911 is? Do you have that here? Okay. And so, um, is it 911 here, or is it something different? 112. 112. Okay, cool. Um, so anyway, we get a call, and so we'll, we'll talk to them and say, this is what happened. Uh, and that's kind of our starting point, so we kind of have an idea of where we want to go. Now, it's important for us to remain objective. We don't want to go into the crime scene with any, you know, preconceived ideas of, oh, okay, I know what happened based on what that person told me. Our job is to look at the evidence and tell us, what does the evidence tell me? Because oftentimes, that information is wrong. And I'll, I'll ask Holly, because I have a number in my head. Um, how often is the information you get from 911 incorrect about what happens? I would say most of the time. Things just get lost in translation, especially the caller who's on the phone with um, 911 or 112. Um, so things do get lost in translation, so that's why I usually ask the primary officer who first arrived on the scene, and I'll ask detectives, and I'll kind of keep in mind what they say, but I'm still going to be objective throughout my 
processing of the currency. Yeah, I'd say about 70% of the time, the initial information we get is incorrect. We find that out later as we go through the investigation. Um, we're going to establish or expand our perimeter, make sure we have a good perimeter set up around our, our scene. Uh, we're going to evaluate the need for additional equipment and additional personnel. We're going to talk a little bit about what might we need um, in that in a moment. So, why do people commit crimes? That's a good starting point, right? Every crime has to have a motive. These are the basic motives. Revenge, money, greed, power, sex, narcotics, frustration or hate, mental health, or survival. Can anybody think of a crime motive I haven't thought of? I mean, most of them fall into one of those. You think of why people who commit crimes, generally it's going to be somewhere on one of those. So the motive is important for us to determine why people do the things that they do. That helps us figure out who may be responsible. So this is a, uh, an actual crime scene. Um, this is uh, what we call in the United States an officer-involved shooting. So uh, an officer who was driving this car responded to a, uh, a house located here. Uh, the owner of the house was moving, so he had the process of loading his furniture belongings into the truck. As the officer stepped out of the car, the owner had warrants for his arrest. The uh, owner reached into the front seat of the truck, withdrew a uh, 45 caliber handgun, and began shooting at the officer. The first shot hit the officer in the face. Uh, second shot hit him in the chest. Uh, the officer began to return fire and run. So you can see the uh, area of blood here around the front of the car. The officer took up a position behind the front wheel, which is how we're trained because that's where the engine is and the engine will stop bullets. So you want to be behind something that will stop a bullet. Uh, the officer reloaded his weapon, returned fire, and killed the suspect. The suspect is actually lying right here. Um, so when I arrived at the scene, these numbers are marking uh, spent shell casings from the weapons at the scene. So the local sheriff's department began to work the crime scene and somewhere along the way they realized we should call in a neutral party to work this. So they called, I worked for the state at the time, so they called the state police in and we came in to work this. So this was how I found the scene. Uh, now interesting about this particular scene, so this is what we call medical debris. This is all of the things from the ambulance crew that came here and worked on this officer. After the officer shot the suspect, uh, the officer got on his radio and called him uh, for a helicopter, a light, we call life flight ambulance helicopter. Um, he took off his gun belt and made himself a tourniquet. He'd been shot in the leg and his femoral artery was hit. So he was bleeding severely. He made himself a tourniquet. He was life flighted to a hospital where he recovered and he went back to work for the police department um, afterwards. So he survived, um, stayed in the fight, did a great job, and uh, we were left working the scene. But this is very typical of what a scene looks like when we get there. Uh, lots of people, lots of things going on, lots of other stuff has happened, and then our job is to go through and you know, figure out you know, what, what exactly occurred at that scene. Sometimes we need help, we need extra people. Um, although on television, the crime scene, have you ever noticed the crime scene people on TV are experts in everything? Whatever it is, they just know the answer. Uh, we don't always do that. I pretend that I'm an expert, but not always. So these are some of the people. We might need more crime scene specialists. We have lots of bodies, lots of evidence. We're not need help. Anthropologists. Uh, sometimes we have skeletal remains. We have bones. Uh, if you work in the uh, rural, uh, does rural translate here? Is that a normal word for you guys? Out of the city. Um, you know, sometimes you'll have animals that'll show up, like your, your dog shows up with a bone in its mouth. And it's hard to tell the femur from a deer from the femur of a human, unless you really know a lot about bones. Um, so we, we have anthropologists that we'll, re, you know, we'll reach out to and show them photographs, let them look at bones and help us determine you know, what we're looking at. Odontology, does anybody know what odontology is? Yeah, there you go, teeth, right, there you go. So yeah, dental records. Now we don't have a database of dental records, like in the movies, they'll just take a you know, cast of the teeth and they'll put it in a computer and then it pops up a picture of the individual and where they're located, you know, at that moment. Um, we don't have that. Uh, but we do use dentists to help us. Uh, primarily, if we have burned bodies, we have fires, and we can't do DNA, we can't do fingerprints, we can do dental records. So we like to have access to an odontologist. A uh, coroner, we have coroners and medical examiners in the United States. Uh, the coroner is the person who pronounces the body dead. It's like an official person who says, yes, you're dead. Um, and, uh, yeah, you think we would be able to do that because we're police, but we can't. Um, 
and, uh, and then the medical examiner, they do the autopsy. An autopsy is the op an operation to determine what caused this person to die. We're going to talk a little bit about causes of death and manner of death, and they're, and they're different. Um, but the uh, medical examiner of the coroner helps us. Traffic, um, sometimes we have a body that's out in the middle of a public roadway, and we have to work the crime scene. And it's hard to work the crime scene with cars going by at 80 miles an hour. Um, so we have to contact traffic to come out and reroute the road uh, while we're working on it. Aviation, uh, not Jim Lee Aviation, I don't need a 767, um, but uh, sometimes we have a helicopter come out, we want to take aerial photography of our scenes. Uh, we're getting to where we don't do that as much now because now we're using drones. Uh, so we can have a drone much cheaper than putting a helicopter in the air, uh, and we can get really good photographs off of drones these days. But if we need that, that's an option. EOD, that's emergency, I mean, yeah, explosive ordnance disposal, that's the bomb technicians. So if I get into a situation where it looks like somebody might be building a bomb, I've actually had a crime team where the, the, uh, it was a student who was building bombs in his house, and they said, Jeff, we need you to go work that. And I said, all I need to work a bomb is a pair of tennis shoes and a pair of binoculars. Um, as far as I can get away from that bomb, I'm good. Um, so I have the bomb guys go make sure that scene is safe, and then we'll go in and process the evidence in the scene after the, the explosive guys do their thing. Canines, uh, that's our dogs. We use lots of dogs. Uh, we have dogs that search for drugs. We have dogs that search for bodies. We have dogs that search for explosives. Um, so it just depends on you know, what we need at that particular scene. All right, so we're going to do an initial walkthrough. We get to the crime scene. We've got our search warrant. We're safe. We're good to go. One of the things we're going to do is we're going to walk through the scene and say, what can I tell right now? What do I know? Um, we're going to hopefully do that with someone from our local agency. This is a good opportunity to look around our scene and evaluate if we need additional equipment. And there's things that you don't think about when you're talking about this, but when you get out in the field that you realize, oh, wow, that's something I need. Like sometimes I'll go in a house that is so dilapidated that it's about to cave in as I walk every step. I'm kind of like, I hope it's forward and collapse when I fall through. So... Um, We'll have the fire department come out and um, secure the floor. We would call shoring up. I don't know if that translates well here. But we'll shore up the floor and have them make the floor safe. Uh, sometimes we go to the house and they have a very large dog that's very angry. Um, and so we'll call animal control to come out and, hey, take care of that dog, and then I'll go work the crime scene. Uh, so what else are you going to do special? Anything else? All right. Um, and then we make assignments. Um, so there's usually a lot of people at the crime scene, and so I want to give them all a job. Because sometimes there's people that just want to stand around, they don't really want to do anything, they just want to be there. Um, so when you start giving jobs, those people usually leave because they don't want to get a job. Uh, and I usually, when I teach police officers a lot, so I tell the police officers, if you don't know who that is in your department, it might be you. Um, so, you know, be a worker, don't be just standing around doing nothing, drinking all the coffee. All right, so... This is something that we would find in a crime scene. So first of all, can anybody tell me what this is? Something dead. Something dead. Good answer. <laughs> right. Anybody else? It's a skull. All right. It's a human skull. Very good. It's kind of upside down. So let me orient for you. This will be the left eye. This will be the bridge of the nose. This will be the nostrils. Right eye. The jaw or mandible. Okay, so what happened to this person? We're doing an initial walkthrough. We're walking through. We're looking at the scene. So what do we think happened? Too much sun. Too much sun. <laughs> Not using sunscreen. Yeah. <laughs> Close, but not quite. Anybody else? Fire. What's that? Fire. Fire. Right. And that's what most people say. Fire. Okay, this is not fire. Uh, it looks like fire. Yeah, we're the experts, so you don't count. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that's what most people say. Oh, fire. This is just decomposition. This is a Caucasian female. Um, and so when we look closely, whoops. <laughs> our experts are going to find out. That's our real experts, though. But. So when we look closely, you see there's hair still intact here. There's leaves. So these are things that would not be here if we had a fire. Um, so if we look closely, what do we see? We see anything unique about this skull? I mean, not that you're looking at skulls every day. <laughs> see this little gap right here? It's cracked. It's cracked, right? It's a fracture. Okay, so that's the left eye orbit. That's this bone right here. That'd be a fracture. So what has to happen to fracture that bone? Yeah, you have to get hit pretty hard, right? Pretty significant trauma. 
So at this point, early in the investigation, I'm thinking, okay, I'm looking for trauma. Now, could this person have been stabbed or shot or drug overdosed? Yeah, I'm not going to rule anything out at this point, but we're going to look at what does the evidence tell me, and based on that, what's the most logical, what's the most reasonable explanation that we can come up with? So as we approach this, we're going to start looking at, let's look for blunt force trauma. Now, in this particular case, once we collect this body and we send it to the autopsy, they call me back and say she has multiple skull fractures and the cause of death is trauma to the head. So that, in fact, was an accurate assumption. It could be wrong, but that's why we do an autopsy. But at this point, we want to know what can we tell initially when we look at the scene. Now, when you call a crime scene, you expect this, right? I don't look like that on the scene. <laughs> yeah, Holly has to go to scene in like a mini skirt. I don't skirt heels and my hair is definitely up. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in reality, you get something that looks more like this in the United States. So, uh, all right. So one of the things that we did, we get to the crime scene. One of the most important parts is we want to document what happened. We want to make a record of that scene. Because if this case, if we end up making a criminal case and taking someone to court, there's, um, they're not going to get to come to that scene and see it. So we're going to document it. So photography is really important for us. So we do what we call overall, mediums, and close-ups. So start off with a big photograph and kind of work our way down towards the evidence in increments. We take lots and lots of photos. Uh, we use digital photography now. When I started doing this like a thousand years ago, uh, we did black and white film, and I used to have to come back and develop it in the office. Um, and so now digital is so much better. Uh, we do macro photography, which is close-ups, fingerprints, tool marks, uh, blood spatter, those types of things. They're really close-up photos, and we're going to look at some of those in a moment. And we do aerial, and then we do low light, we call painting with light. Oftentimes our crime scenes are outside, or they're in dark buildings or dark houses. So we have to have the proper techniques to photograph where you can light them properly and see what you're looking at. And then we also do what we call alternate light source. Sometimes we look at different wavelengths of light will reflect different things. And those of you who are in the science department, you I'm sure have dealt with that. Um, we use uh, 455 nanometers of light. It's kind of a big one for us in the US. Um, it fluoresces seminal fluid and vaginal secretions, um, things that we look for in sexual assault cases. So we use that a lot. Um, but you have to know how to photograph it because once we find the item of evidence, we want to photograph it before we collect it. So if the camera, you have to know how to make the camera see that particular wavelength of light. A, uh, a fluorescent light. Um, sometimes we use ultraviolet light too, just depends on where we are, what kind of light source we're, we're using. Um, but if you find a fingerprint like this at a crime scene that looks really good like that, it's usually the police officer who was clearing the scene. Um, the bad guys never leave prints that good. But, uh, this is a, a note from a bank robbery. So this individual went in and handed a note to the teller, um, instructing them to place money in a brown bag. Um, and fortunately, he left the note behind. So we collected the note from the bank, and we fingerprinted the note with a chemical called ninhydrin. Ninhydrin is an amino acid stain. So when you touch paper, your body's going to leave some amino acids on that paper. And it's just the paper is porous. It's going to absorb into the paper. And this chemical will stain that for us. Uh, and then we're close. There's our fingerprint. And then we're looking for this kind of detail here. Like this is called bifurcation. So we try to find this detail. And then if we have a suspect, we can compare this to a suspect's fingerprint. We'll take a close-up photograph with a, with a measuring device. We call it a scale. And that way we know the size of that particular print. And then we have a computer system called APHIS. APHIS is the Automated Fingerprint Identification System. So we, you guys use APHIS too? Awesome. So we can enter this, phone, this fingerprint into APHIS, and then it searches some databases to see if this individual has been arrested before so that we can identify who the person may be. So that's kind of how APHIS works. Now, I'm going to show you an APHIS hit here in a minute um, because it's not like you see on television. This is, a, uh, this is a sexual assault case where we had a pair of underwear uh, that we found in a scene, and we process the underwear with the proper wavelength of light, we can find seminal fluid. Um, so in this case, it looks similar to this. We can then swab this, send this to the lab. The lab can do DNA. Um, and in this particular case, um, this individual was molested by her uncle. Um, and of course, he denied it when we you know, initially interviewed him. And then we did a DNA test, and we matched our, the DNA from her underwear to him. We had a warrant to get a sample of his DNA. Uh, and then we went to trial. Now normally, when you have a DNA match and 
a man, man's semen is in a little girl's underwear. He only pleads guilty and goes to jail. Um, this gentleman wanted to go to trial. He went to trial. And um, he, uh, he took the stand. In the United States, you have the right to take the stand and defend yourself. And he took the stand in his own defense. And he told this story that he has this medical problem that semen just shoots out for no apparent reason. And so her underwear must have been laying in the bathroom floor. And some must have just landed in her underwear. And that's, what, that's how it happened. And uh, he's serving 35 years right now in prison. Uh, so the jury did not find that to be a credible story. So uh, this is an uh, example we call alternate light source. So this is a, a case that I worked on uh, where we had a missing hiker. She went hiking in a mountain in this area, uh, 26 years old, and didn't come home. And so we started searching for her. And as we worked the case, we identified a suspect, um, a gentleman that was driving a white van. We recovered this van. It was full of uh, debris and trash and um, personal belongings. We cleaned it out. And then we used a chemical that will, when it comes in contact with the proteins in blood and the hemoglobin, it will glow. It create, creates a, a process called chemiluminescence. Um, and uh, you guys use Blue Star or Luminol? Okay. So you guys have the same thing here. Um, and there's a couple different blood reagents. This one uh, will happen to be luminol. So we process this vehicle with this chemical called luminol, and it, it, it'll pick up very, very trace amounts of blood. So so small that I can't see it with the naked eye, but the chemical will help find it for us. So we process this vehicle, and it looks like I pushed the wrong button. All right. So it looks like this when we photograph it. So. Now, this doesn't mean that was one giant blood stain. Okay? Um, that's a lot, people see that and they go, oh wow, that's a lot of blood. So, if you spill chocolate sauce on your couch, you take a, a cloth, put some water on it, and you clean it. What are you doing to that sauce? Spreading it. You're spreading it. You're diluting it to a large enough scale that you can't see it anymore. Which is really kind of gross if you think about it. Because <laughs> we don't ever really clean anything. We just spread it out enough we can't tell it's there anymore. Um, so if you're a germaphobe, that will make you stay up at night. Um, so, uh, yeah, so in this case, he's cleaning out the back of his van, so he's spreading this blood over a larger area. So as we processed this van, we collected DNA, and we got DNA that matched our victim. But then we also got DNA that matched uh, another, uh, we had an unknown female profile, and we had an unknown male profile. So at that point, we started reaching out to other law enforcement agencies who had unsolved murder cases. Um, we were able to identify the female DNA out of Florida, which was about nine hours away from our area by the car. And we identified the male suspect, male DNA uh, to a case in North Carolina, which was about four and a half hours away from our area. In the North Carolina case, a husband and wife were killed. So this gentleman was actually a serial killer. He killed a husband and wife in North Carolina. He killed a victim in Georgia. He killed a victim in Florida. And probably more that we don't know about. Um, so we were able to use forensics to find evidence of multiple cases. Sometimes you find more than you're looking for. And this is a, a great example of that happening. This is just another example of uh, photographing Blue Star. So we have a red towel, and there's blood on the red towel, but you can't see it. But with the right chemical applied, you see these nice purpley blue glow. That's the area where the blood's located. So as a crime scene investigator, I'm going to process it, I'm going to photograph it, and I'm going to collect samples from those areas, and then I'll send those samples to the DNA lab. The person who does the DNA analysis is a different person than me. That's a lab technician. So like, if you watch the old CSI TV show, you know, Gil Grissom will go out to the crime scene and collect the evidence, then he brings it back to the lab, and he does the processing in the lab. That's not how it works in the United States. Does that work that way here? No, same thing. So, yeah, people that are lab scientists are lab scientists, and that's what they do. They generally don't come out of the field, um, so it's a little different. Now, there's lots of different laboratories we use. Uh, the state has a crime lab. Uh, the federal government has labs, and then there are private companies that have labs that we can send things to if we want them quicker. The government labs are very slow to get returns back. You get re how long does it take you to get a DNA result here? About a week. See, that's like lightning fast. Um, yeah, for us, uh, two months, three months, sometimes. Yeah. So yeah, it just depends on you know, depends on the case, right? How important it is, and all that good stuff. All right. So this is a uh, this call came in at uh, like about two o'clock in the morning, 
And it told us that they had a, uh, a rape murder. Victim was found under a stairwell at a church. So this is the initial scene. So when we arrive at the crime scene, this is the church. And uh, this is in the mountains of North Georgia, a very small town. So our local police have done a good job of putting crime scene tape around. Uh, I can't figure out if the car is in the crime scene or out of the crime scene. Because um, they have a piece of tape there, then they put another one over here, but sometimes that happens. The trunk is out. The trunk is out, the hood's in. So, uh, so the stairwell where our victim is located is right here. So she's at the bottom of the stairwell, um, and she's found by a caretaker at the church who goes in and opens up and getting ready for Sunday services. So this happened early in the morning. So I respond to the scene. So you know, my initial information was it was a rape murder that occurred at the church, and we found our victim. So we start on the outside of our crime scene and work our way in. And now it's not always the case, because you guys do the opposite, right? You start inside and go out? No, we'll typically start outside, especially if it's raining or if it's nighttime. We kind of want to take care of what's going on outside first, and then we'll work our way in. Because if we don't have that search warrant that we talked about, I can't really go inside and do anything just yet. So that kind of gives me time to work my scene outside if I have one, and then work our way inside. So we start on the outside, so I'm going to look at the car first. We run the license plate on the car, and I get a hit on the computer that it's a missing person. So this particular individual has been listed missing for a couple of days, again, which is not uncommon if you know something's happened. We look inside the car, and this is the interior. So does anything strike you as odd inside the car? Bottle? Right. Anybody know what the bottle is? Oil, not oil. What's that? Coolant fluid. Coolant fluid. There you go. Right. We call it antifreeze. Yeah, coolant fluid. Right. So you got coolant in the front seat of the car. Now, is that suspicious? What's the time of the... Uh, time of the year? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was probably fall. Not real cold. Suspicious. Suspicious. Okay. <laughs> well... <laughs> so a lot of it depends on the car, right? So if this is like a... Um, like an 81 Buick Skylark with a uh, coat hanger for an antenna for the radio and a rag for the gas cap because we have cars like that and four different tires. Um, a bottle of antifreeze or coolant might not be odd in the front seat because they might be putting coolant in the car every 20 miles driving down the road. But on a Mercedes 500 that's fairly new and in good condition, yeah, I would call this suspicious. Why is there coolant in the front? Also, uh, the keys are right here. So, depending on where you work, and I'm going to pick on Holly's area for a minute. In my area, you can park a Mercedes with the keys in it, and it'll still be there two days later. What happens in the cab county if you park a Mercedes with the keys in it? It will be gone in five seconds. <laughs> yeah. Even if so it's not in the car. Yeah. yeah, they'll steal a car in her area while you're putting gas in it. <laughs> and they just want to drive it about half a mile, then they'll ditch it, wreck it, and it's towed. So. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so in this case, key's still in the car, antifreeze in the front seat. So it looks a little odd. Um, so we're going to take a closer look at it. There's a notebook. Inside the notebook, there's a handwritten note. Now, in this note, it says, I'll read the last line. It says, Clay, I'm requesting that you cremate me and throw my ashes in the garbage. Do not have any service for me, for I am not deserving of one. So what does that sound like? Suicide. Suicide, right? Okay. So are we ready to close this case and rule it a suicide? Why? Uh, the coolant fluid. The coolant fluid. Okay. <laughs> so, what do I need to know? Was she forced to write it or not? Okay. That's a good question. What else would we want to know? Did she write it? Did she write it? Right. So, we might want to have a handwriting analysis done. Okay. What else do I want to know? There's a big question right now that we still don't know the answer to. Okay, was she forced to ride it? What else? Whose car is it? Whose car is it? It's her car. We know that. What's that? Yeah, well, let's take that a step further. What happened to her? How'd she die? We don't know that yet, do we? So, what if she has a gunshot wound? Is that going to make things a little different? Yeah, what if she strangled? Right, we don't know what happened to her at this point. So, I can't rule it suicide because I don't have a cause of death. I don't know what happened. So, as we continue to look in the car... 
Uh, we're going to start fingerprinting some of the items of evidence in that car. Because again, we want to know, did she write this note? So are her fingerprints on the note? Is her handwriting on the note? Uh, that kind of stuff. So we're going to get back to her in just a moment. So we're going to fingerprint the crime scene. And you guys have seen fingerprint. We walk around with a little brush. It looks like a makeup brush, uh, but you don't want to put it on your face. And um, in a black powder, we put powder for fingerprints. That's one of the many ways that we can fingerprint things. Uh, we're going to fingerprint the individual items of evidence. We're going to post more, and we're going to print the dead body. Because sometimes we don't know who the person is. And if I can't identify the body, that makes it very difficult to find out what happens to them. So we're actually going to ink their fingers and roll their fingers. Sometimes we do that out in the field, and then sometimes we have that done at the autopsy. Do you guys do postmortems in the field, or do you, you do it at the morgue? Okay. And then we'll take elimination prints. So elimination prints are something you don't see a lot on TV. Uh, but if I went to Don McGoy's house, because it was a crime scene. And I dusted his house because it was stolen property. And I found his fingerprints in the room where the stolen property was. What does that tell me? Nothing. Nothing, because he lives there, right? So if I find any fingerprint in his house, I need to know, is it his? Or is it some unknown person's that might be the suspect? So I need to get a set of his fingerprints so that way I can compare those. Those are what we call elimination prints. Now, he's probably already in the system. Uh, <laughs> so I might not have to know his <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you, you're in the system, I'm in the system, Holly's in the system. Yeah, if we're in this business, we're already fingerprinted. But we will have to get elimination prints. So this is the coffee mug that's in our Mercedes. So I want to fingerprint this coffee mug. But I also want to look at the content. So inside the mug, there's this kind of greenish liquid. So I'm going to take a sample of this liquid, send it to the lab. The lab tells me that it's coolant mixed with orange juice. So I know what's in the, in the uh, cup. And then on the outside, I get this thumbprint. This is a left thumb. Now, we use a, a, a process called cyanoacrylate fuming. That sounds really technical. It makes me sound like I'm smart because I can say cyanoacrylate. What is cyanoacrylate? It's actually super glue. It's, it's super very, glue. Very common. Yeah. So, yeah. So, in the office, we call it super glue fuming. But on the stand in court, I call it cyanoacrylate. Oh. But yeah, we put super glue in a little container and we heat it and super glue turns from a liquid to a gas and that gas will adhere to the water and the oil that forms the fingerprint and you get a print that looks like this. So we do a comparison. This ends up being the left thumbprint of Elise Doss. So now I have her left thumbprint on the cup with the antifreeze. We have an autopsy that says her cause of death was ingesting antifreeze. They're able to tell that from looking at the kidneys. It forms crystals in the kidneys. Uh, so now we know what, what sort of cause of death. So now... What are we going to call this? Are we ready to call it suicide yet? Nope. 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 Okay, why? What else do we want? Did you find the uh, ID card or driver's license? All of her personal effects are in the car. Her purse, her wallet, her keys, her ID, everything's in there. Um, she wrote the note. Uh, we have her fingerprints on the note. And we have a handwriting analysis that says it's her handwriting. No, is, she is she right-handed? She is right-handed, yes. And that's a great question. So, right, remember, how did this call come in? It came in as a rape murder, right? So I'm like, okay, so how does she end up under a stairwell with her pants pulled down dead? So as we talk with our medical examiner, one of the things that he tells us is when you drink antifreeze, your body is not very happy about that. Because um, your body knows, hey, I don't need this in me, and it seems to get out. So your body starts to flood your intestines with fluid to get rid of that, and they get very violent diarrhea. So... In the back corner behind the stairwell, we found the area where she had gone to the bathroom. So she went down under the stairwell to use the bathroom, and she dropped over and died in that area. So at this point, we have to decide, do we have enough? Now, can I do more? Can we take more samples and more evidence? Absolutely. So when is enough? When are you to the point you say, okay, I have enough that I think this is a reasonable explanation? And that's a decision that we have to make every day. Now, again, I don't know how it works in, in Croatia, but I'm assuming it's similar to where I am. Will they let you do every test on every case you work? No. no. Yeah. <laughs> Not, yeah, just that, yeah, no way. Not going to happen. Right. So if I collect 100 items of DNA evidence, I'll get one DNA test out of that. Um, and that's just how it works. If that doesn't come back, I can submit another item. But we don't have unlimited tests and unlimited resources. So somewhere along the way, we have to look at what is reasonable. What gives us the ability to say, okay, we have gone as far as we think we need to go on this. If the evidence takes us a different direction, then we'll follow it wherever it takes us. But I can't continue to do testing and spend man hours on a case when we're reasonably sure this is what occurred. 
And so that's a decision that has to get made on a daily basis by everybody in this business. And so that's, uh, that's part of what we do. All right, this is a fingerprint comparison, just so if you want to see what one looks like. So we have individual points we call minutia. So this would be a, uh, we call it ending ridge, and this is a similar ending ridge. This is a, uh, an island, this is an island. This is a bifurcation, this is a bifurcation. So we like eight points to match. We don't have a set number that says you have to have this number of points. Do you guys have a set, a fixed number of points? No. So you just look at the print and decide, is there enough that's sufficient here to say yes? This is, we don't even use the word match anymore. We use the term individualized. So this print was individualized to this person based on the minutia that we find. Uh, fingerprints are really great for us. Uh, it's, a, it's a fast way to ID somebody. Uh, fingerprints are formed while you're in your mother's womb before you're born. They stay the same throughout your life. Everybody in this room has either loop of whirl or arch or one of the three or combination. And so you all have one of those and it will never change. If you cut your finger and you cut it deep enough to scar it, um, it'll change the image because the scar will be there, but it doesn't change the pattern. You still will have that same pattern that you've already had. A scar just makes it even more unique than it was before. Uh, it makes it easier for us to identify. So fingerprints will actually differentiate twins, which is kind of interesting because identical twins have the same DNA, but they have different fingerprints, um, which is kind of cool. What's that? Well, I guess it depends on um, who invented it. Well, I don't know. Again, it depends on which which version. Uh, Perkinji is it? Mm -hmm. Ivan Vucevic. Ivan who? Ivan Vucevic. A Croatian. A Croatian guy. Oh, really? That seems funny because I haven't heard that before. Uh, who was it? Perkinji they tell us. Uh, and then we have the guy. Uh, who's the guy that developed the Henry system? Um, Henry. The, no, it's not Henry. <laughs> <laughs> This is probably, uh, oh, I can't think of his name. He, he was on a train and he developed a classification system that we used to use. And it, he must have been smoking something on the train. It's, it's, it's not right. Um, so good, that's another famous Croatian. That's good to know. Yeah. Because right. I, I got into a debate with somebody the other day about um, Tesla. Um, yeah. Cool story. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, so this is APHIS. This is the Automated Fingerprint Identification System. So this is a partial fingerprint that we get from a crime scene. We enter it into the system and it can mark points on it and then the system uses a mathematical algorithm and it will search the database and see if it can find those matching points on another print. Now, again, on TV, on CSI, you put the print in, it takes it like 30 seconds and then it pops up a photograph of the bad guy in his current location where you can go find it. Um, and that's awesome, and we, but we don't have that. Uh, so with a real APIS hit, it looks like this, and then you see here there's a number, so this gives me six possibilities. These are six individuals that have been arrested, and we will have to manually pull that fingerprint card and with a magnifying glass look at the prints and compare them manually. And that's how APIS works. And to run this new APIS, it may take anywhere from 30, 45 minutes to three or four hours, depending on how busy the system is and how many people are running the search. So it's not instantaneous like we see in the movies, um, and it's still a uh, still a manual process. This is a uh, this is a shooting scene out of the mountains of North Georgia, and uh, we use this to kind of illustrate the value of aerial photography. So my victim is lying here under a sheet. He's been covered up. He's been shot two times. Um, he was out in a garden working in his garden area. And his wife found him outside. Across the street from where his residence is. Is a um, is a mobile home. Do you have mobile homes here? I haven't seen any throughout the city, but in, in America we have mobile homes. They're like long, skinny aluminum boxes that you can live in, um, and uh, that sound appealing, right? <laughs> so, so across the street is a mobile home, and the, the man who lives in the mobile home is a mental health patient, and he recently been released from a mental health hospital, uh, and was not taking his medicine, was paranoid, schizophrenic, and for whatever reason decided that this gentleman was out to get him. So. He walked across a small dirt road and um, lay in the woods and shot and killed our, our, our defendant. Um, the problem here is on this um, area, I can't see that house because this is on top of a hill and the house where the suspect lives is down a steep embankment. So from a photographic standpoint, I can't, I can't see it, although it's not very far away. So when we take an aerial photograph, 
This is where the shed, this is where our victim is. This is where my suspect lives. And so it's a very short walk across here. We actually walked this area and recovered some shell casings in this area that we matched to a gun we found in his house. So we're able to put the case together. Uh, but the aerial photography is very helpful to illustrate to a jury who doesn't get to go to the scene, this is how close they live. But I can't show that by standing on the ground and taking photographs. All right, video. Video is a big thing now in the US. Um, and it has changed a lot in my career. Uh, because I'm old, I remember beta. Do uh, you remember Betamax? Yeah, um, and VHS, the big tapes. Um, yeah, most of you are young, too young to remember that, but some of you. Um, and so you know, now we have video everywhere. In the United States, we wear body camera video every day at work. Do, you, do your officers wear video? Yeah. So everything we do now is videotaped. Uh, so from a crime scene perspective, we go to the scene, we want to look around, what is there? We're going to take video like they're videoing this, this talk tonight. So we're going to video that scene, but we're also going to look around and see, does that person have surveillance video? Is it a, is it a convenience store and they have, or a grocery store that has video or a bank that has video? Because oftentimes we can capture that. Um, in America, and I think it's very similar here, everybody has a cell phone, right? And every cell phone has a video camera. So when something happens, what's everybody doing? <laughs> Filming with the video camera. And so oftentimes we get really good video from bystanders from witnesses who saw what happened. So we want to collect that uh, patrol car video. We have cameras in our patrol cars. So lots of different things we do with video. Crime scene sketches. I'm going to let Holly tell you about because she's an expert in sketching. I don't know if I would say expert, but I've had to do a lot of them. And that's the first thing I actually learned when I started my job almost a year or over a year ago. Um, so sketches, really, that's just for court purposes because when we go to court the jury like you said before they're not able to go to the crime scene even though we do take photographs and we video the scene they still like to see the sketches and so usually if I have an outdoor scene I can use Google Earth to kind of see where my crime scene happened if there's a lot of trees then I'm gonna have to manually draw it on a computer program but for houses as well I have to take measurements of each and every wall so if I get crazy houses that have not square rooms, then those can kind of be difficult, but it's just for court purposes. So whenever you look at the sketch, it's kind of like a blueprint and you can see where each piece of evidence is and I get to place the body as there as well. So that can be very time consuming, giving, getting measurements of the house. I actually had a scene, it was about a month ago, a old elderly woman was found dead at the bottom of her stairs and it was a three story house. So when I pulled up there, I was like, oh, I'm going to have to sketch this whole entire house. So that scene took me about three or four hours. I did have a partner, and it turns out that her son actually stabbed her because he didn't want to go back to jail for an embezzlement charge. Yeah, that makes sense, right? I don't want to go to jail for embezzlement, so I'm going to stab somebody. So I'm not going to go to jail for that. So the advantage of a crime scene sketch is it supplements the photograph, but we can draw just the items that we want to show in the sketch. We can leave out all the non-important things. So a field sketch looks something like this. We use a uh, X and Y coordinate to document our measurements. So this is a hand drawn in the field. That's kind of what it looks like. Then we'll come back. We can clean it up with, you know, have a straight edge, make it look a little nicer. Now, when I started a crime scene almost 30 years ago, this is what I would take to court. It would look very similar to this. Um, now, we don't do this anymore. So now we'll take this sketch and we'll take the data and we'll enter that into a crime scene sketching program. And basically, it's a computer-aided drafting. It's like a CAD program. Uh, you can buy like a house design program to design a home. It's the same concept, but like in my pull down, like a, in a house design program, you'll pull down window and you can put a ficus tree or you can put a sofa. My pull down menu has like guns and drugs and weapon, you know, blood spatter. It's like click and drag them over and put those things in my crime scene. So computer sketch looks kind of like this. So we can kind of add everything in there. And then if we enter all of our window heights, our door heights, our ceiling heights, we can take this and make a 3D rendering. Our sketch looks like this. And then I can take this sketch, I can rotate it on any axis. So if somebody wants to know what could a witness looking through this window see, we can rotate it, it can be to scale and show exactly what the scene would look like um, in a model. So this is something that we do a lot of report. 
Uh, so if you're a computer science person, um, this is great. We love people who are really good at computers and can do this. Uh, this is a little more fingerprinting. This is a, uh, we call it a patent print. And this is a print that's in blood. So there's blood on this car. This fingerprint is in that blood. Um, and so it's actually, and we, and we love this kind of evidence in a, in a crime scene. So we have victim's blood and the suspect's fingerprint in it. So it's kind of hard to explain how you have the dead guy's blood on your hand and left the print behind. Uh, they're fun stories to hear them try to explain how it got there. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it doesn't usually pan out real well for the suspect. All right, firearms. We have lots of guns in the United States. If you watch movies, you see it all the time, right? In a police movie, we get a car chase and a shootout every day, right? Um, at least that's what Hollywood makes it look like. So we do get firearms evidence um, in the United States a good bit. So we can tell the type and caliber of weapon. We can calculate the gunshot trajectory. I know we have some math majors in the room, so trigonometry, right? Everybody loves that. You know, um, but uh, that's what we're doing. So. Um, we can look at and, and basically find out, you know, where was our, our shooter located at the time the shot was fired. Um, is the weapon at the scene? That's important information because if the weapon's not at the scene, what does that mean? You can kill again. They can kill again. It means that I need to find the weapon. It means the officers that are out there looking for this person need to realize they may, they may still be armed. Um, so that's important information for us to get out to the officers as quickly as we can. Hey, if there's not a weapon here, you need to be looking for a particular type of weapon. And is the weapon that seemed consistent with the victim's injuries? Is it possible that somebody may have stabbed somebody or shot somebody and threw a weapon down to alter our scene? Yeah. So I've been called to scenes and been told, oh, this guy was shot with a shotgun. And I look at him like, that's a handgun injury. That's not from a shotgun. Um, so it's important that we look at what is the evidence the scene tells, not just draw a conclusion. Well, that gun here must be the one that shot him. So this is a, uh, a gun from a shooting scene. Um, on this particular case, this, this individual went to his girlfriend's house and uh, took himself hostage, held a gun to his own head, and uh, she was trying to, to break up with him, and he said, you know, take me back or I'll shoot myself, which apparently is very appealing to women, I guess he thinks. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how that's going to end up. Now. Oh, okay, I'll take you back since you're mentally unstable and have a gun. Um, <laughs> so, so anyway, he holds himself hostage, and they call the SWAT team. Do you have SWAT teams here? Is that, okay. So the SWAT team comes out, and the SWAT team, you know, basically tells him, "Hey, you've got like five minutes. Give yourself up, or we're going to get you out of the car." So the SWAT team approaches the car to get him out, and according to one of the SWAT guys, uh, this gentleman fired a shot at the SWAT team. SWAT team shot back. They hit him two times. So our, our suspect is shot once in the chest, once in the leg. Suspect lives. He's okay. He gets transported to the hospital. So when I get to the scene, this is what I have. I have this gun laying in the front seat of a car, and he's been transported, and I've been told that the officer fired two shots, and the suspect fired one. So I'm like, okay, this is gonna be a pretty simple case, right? So I open the gun, and this is what I find when I look in the gun. Nice. No shots fired. No shots fired, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm like, mm. <laughs> so now I have to figure out. Now the witnesses all say they heard three shots. So the officers are issued, they carry a semi-automatic handgun. Uh, they carry Glocks in most places in the US. So he's carrying a Glock handgun. He has three magazines. He has one magazine in the gun, two magazines on his belt. Each magazine has 17 rounds of ammunition issued to him. And we know that. So when we have an officer involved shooting, we collect the officer's gun and all their ammunition and we count it. So when we count his magazine, he's missing three rounds out of the magazine in his gun. So I have, Witnesses say three shots were fired. I have three rounds missing out of the officer's gun. On the ground outside of the car, I have three spent shell casings. Okay? So what am I missing now? I'm missing one bullet. I have two bullets in my suspect. Where's the third bullet? Where'd the third shot go? In the car. So we start looking at the car. So as we examine the car, we find a bullet hole in the passenger seat. We track the laser through the bullet hole and it places my shooter right outside the car where the officer said he was standing where he found the three shell casings. So we go back to the officer and we tell the officer, hey, um, suspect fired no shots. You fired three shots. Officer says, no, I fired two. Is the officer lying? Yep. Yes. Okay, maybe. maybe. Does the officer remember how many shots he fired? He 
He should. Probably no, not. Nope, nope, nope. I'll say, how many people have been shot at in this room? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Huh? Paintball does not count. <laughs> no, the, the adrenaline and the stress of the right. situation can Right. Yeah, I've been in a shooting. I'm just telling you. You, you don't know. You're just thinking, right. you know, that dude's shooting me. i got to go get cover and shoot back. You know? And so, yeah, so I'm not willing to say that the officer's lying. I'm saying that the evidence tells me a certain fact. The evidence tells me he fired three shots. I have two shots in the suspect, one shot in the car. I have three shots. I'm confident with the evidence because it, it tells me what it tells me. Whether he believes me or not, I have no control over that. And that's not my job. My job is to document the facts of the case as, they, as they're there. Now, what's the most reasonable explanation of what happened? He fired three shots, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, the end. That's pretty, it's pretty uh, straightforward. Is there a possibility that the gun was fired? Is there a possibility the gun misfired? He accidentally fired a third shot. He didn't say that. I don't have any way to know that. Now, what we do in every officer involved shooting is we take the gun to the lab and we have a function test. We test fire the weapon, so we, we can say once we collected the weapon, the weapon was functioning properly, or if it's misfunction, malfunctioning, then we can document that as well. Um, but in this case, the, the weapon was functioning fine. I think he just thought he fired two and he fired three. Uh, just the adrenaline, and you know, it doesn't change the shooting for us because um, under our laws in the United States, if somebody points a gun at a police officer, we don't have to wait for them to shoot before we can shoot back. Um, so. It doesn't, it doesn't affect the, the validity of the shooting in any way. Uh, but again, sometimes statements are not exactly accurate. And that's why I love forensics, because the evidence is the evidence. It tells us what it tells us. <coughs> Oops, all way. All right, so like I said, follow the evidence. That's what we're here to do. We want to, the evidence takes us where it takes us. Sometimes it takes us places we have no idea what's going to go. You know, when I showed you the car, we had the serial killer. I thought I would find blood from my victim and that would be the end of it. And it'd be a nice pretty case and I'd take it to court and life was good. And then three months later, I'm down in Florida testifying in another state on a murder because I got blood that matched their victim. We have to follow the evidence and go where it goes. Um, this is some, some processing of lasers through the house. We use different color lasers. I really like green, it photographs better. I don't know if y'all found that when you're photographing lasers. It's way better than red. <clears throat> All right, so this is the muzzle of a 270 deer rifle. Um, does anybody hunt any deer hunters in this area? I don't know if that's something that, I know you do, put your hand down. <laughs> yeah. so, all right, is that like, a, do people hunt? Yeah, 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 it's, it's okay. big, yeah. I'm not a hunter, but we, we have, in the area where I work in the rural North Georgia mountains, we have lots of people who hunt deer. Um, so this gentleman and his wife went deer hunting on Christmas day. And according to the, the husband, she tripped and fell on the gun, and the gun just went off and shot her. <laughs> um, and so, so when I arrived at the scene, he has placed his wife in his truck and has driven halfway to the hospital and stopped on the side of the road and called 911. And we get out there and work the shooting. So if you fall on a gun and a gun goes off, the gun is in contact with the skin. It's what we call a press contact gunshot wound. So if you when you pull the trigger on a gun, you have a bullet or a projectile that comes out. What's making that come out of the gun? Gunpowder. Gunpowder. But what in the gunpowder? You, you ignite the gunpowder, the gunpowder burns, and what, what does it produce? Gases. And the gases force that bullet down the muzzle of that weapon and out. So not only is that bullet coming out, but that gas is coming out behind it because it's pushing it out. So if you place that against the skin, it makes a really ugly entry. Um, because all, not only does the bullet pierce the skin, but all that gas goes in there. And you get a lot of tearing of skin and flesh and blood, and it just, it's, a, it's a mess. They're very messy, messy wounds. Well, when we get to the, the scene and we examine the body, she has one very small, very clean hole in the middle of her chest. It does not look like a press contact gunshot. So I'm, I'm concerned that his, his story doesn't line up. Also, the entrance is in her chest, the exit is in her back, and they're at the same height. So it went in at what we call a flat trajectory. So if she trips and falls on the gun, what's the probability that she's gonna have a flat trajectory? Yeah, pretty, pretty low. So we feel like there's some problems with this statement. So what we do in this case is we swab this for DNA. So this is a macro photograph. You see there's rust. This gun's not very well cared for, but there's no blood, there's no tissue, there's no hair. None of the things that we would normally see. We swab that, we send that to the lab. The lab tells us there's no DNA on this gun. Um, so he tells us he was sitting in the, in the car. 
or she was sitting in the truck with the gun. He was in the woods 68 feet away because he took us out to the woods and showed us where he was hunting. Um, and so we were able to disprove his story based on the forensic evidence at the scene. She has what we call an indeterminate range gunshot wound. She was shot from a far enough distance away that there was no gunpowder, no soot, no deposits on the wound. Um, so that tells us again that that's not a close range wound. So we're able to dispel his story. Now he never would admit that he shot her, but he's serving a life sentence for shooting her. Um, <laughs> this is a, uh, a handgun round. It's a 45 caliber bullet that was taken out of an officer's vest. The officer I showed you in the beginning that was shot, um, this was a bullet taken out of his vest. I like to use this um, example because this is a hollow point. So in the cavity of the hollow point, this bullet did not expand. Um, there's tissue, there's uh, piece of his uniform shirt, a piece of the vest where the bullet went in. So there's lots of really fine forensic evidence here uh, that we have to be very careful about how we collect and process because it's very easy to lose or destroy that. We can also take the, uh, this projectile and compare those lands and grooves to the lands and grooves in the barrel of the weapon that it was fired from to say it came from a particular weapon. Um, and so that's something on officer of all shootings we do a lot. We also have impression evidence. I'm going to show you another crime scene photo. This is probably the most offensive crime scene photo, and I'll show it just for a moment. I'm not trying to offend you or shock value, but it's a very interesting case from a forensic standpoint, uh, but it's also a very horrific case. But there's shoe impressions, there's tire impressions, there's tool marks, uh, and then we also do eliminations. So what's the chances that I'm going to walk around on a crime scene and I'm going to leave a footwear impression in that scene? Pretty good. So. I need to know what my shoes look like so we end up casting an impression and hopefully I'm going to process that before I get to it. So when I get to a body in a room, I usually will start at the doorway and work my way in. We'll look at the floor. We'll do what we call oblique lighting or side lighting to see if there's any evidence on the floor before we step into the room uh, to process it. So in this particular case, this, uh, this was a young lady who was a nurse and she did not show up for work one day. Um, she, uh, her family called the sheriff's department, the local police. They went out to her house to check on her, and the officer found the body in the bedroom. He stopped in the hallway, did not enter her room, which was great. So this is how the body was found at the crime scene. So her hands and feet are bound. Um, this is what we call an arterial spurt. Her carotid artery has been severed. See her feet are bound. And uh, the suspect urinated um, on the body. So on this wood floor, he had stepped in this urine as he walked away. So in doing that, he left footwear impressions on the floor. Um, this is also what we call vertical impact spatter. We'll talk about blood spatter here in just a moment, but he left some, vertical, some uh, footwear impressions so we can photograph these and do a comparison. Now in this particular case, her car was missing. We entered her tag, her license plate, um, into a computer system. And four days later, we got a, um, a call that they just found this car crossing the US border into Canada. So we're in Georgia, we're at the bottom of the US for um, geography purposes. Canada is at the top of the US, you know, way up. So he, he'd driven almost 2,000 miles um, into Canada. And uh, he crossed the border into Canada and the Canadian Customs asked him, you know, why are you here? How long are you gonna be here? Uh, he didn't satisfactorily answer the questions. So they told him he needed to go inside and register with immigration. He didn't like that idea, so he just turned around and drove back across the border, which is a bridge over a river, drove across the border back into the United States. Well, when he pulls into the United States side, we run his tag and they get the alert that we're looking for this vehicle and they arrest him at the U.S. border. Um, so I fly up to the U.S. Canadian border to process the evidence and collect the evidence and interview this individual. Um, and in the truck, he has boots that match these shoes. Uh, in the back seat of his truck. He also has a folding knife in his pocket and we collected the knife and swabbed the knife. We got DNA that matched our victim. Her blood was on the knife that he had. Um, so it was a great case from a forensics side of things. Um, interestingly enough, in the United States, we have the death penalty. Do you have death penalty here? No. Okay. So the United States still has the death penalty. So this would be a death penalty case. We need one. Can't, uh, you need one? <laughs> that, that's a cop right here. <laughs> So uh, Canada does not have the death penalty, and Canada will not extradite somebody for the death penalty. So in this particular case, he was in Canada, but he voluntarily drove himself back to the United States to get arrested. Um, so he's now on death row waiting to be executed because uh, he went to trial. So he stayed in Canada, he at least would have avoided the death penalty. Um, but uh, 
So like I said, forensically, very, very interesting case. Uh, this is another footwear impression. This is on a glass door. Somebody kicked the door to break in a house, and the glass didn't break. And it left a really nice, muddy footwear impression, and we're able to, to document that. All right, DNA. DNA is a big thing. Everybody loves DNA. Uh, and uh, we love DNA. DNA helps us a lot in cases. Uh, we get victim DNA. There's lots of types of evidence. Uh, one of the challenges we have is multi-service items. So if this item, this bottle was an item of evidence, you know, what can we get off of this? Can we get fingerprints? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Can we get DNA? Yep. Yeah, possibly. So we have to make the determination on which service is most important, which one are we going to do first, because we don't want to put a bunch of fingerprint powders on it and damage the DNA evidence, but we don't want DNA to swab the area where our fingerprint might be. So we have to kind of make decisions on what's the best method to process it, what's the most probable chance of getting evidence, and then elimination DNA, just like fingerprints and footwear. We also do blood stain pattern analysis. So this is another um, my math people in the room. Um, you know, when I was in high school, I'd take trig, and I, I said, like most high school math students, I'm never going to have to know this. Why are they making me learn this stuff? And then I became a crime scene investigator, and I wish I paid better attention in school. <laughs> so when you have a drop of blood, if you take the length of the width, divide the length into the width, and take the arc sign and the inverse sign, that will give us the angle of impact. So that tells us the angle at which that particular drop of blood struck the surface. Well, why do I want to know that? Because based on that information, we can figure out where the person was at the time they were impacted and that blood occurred. So the steeper the angle, the more elongated the blood drop. And you, you've all seen this in your own life. You cut your finger and you walk over to the sink and you drip blood where the drops look like they're round, right? Because they're falling vertically and they're striking a 90 degree or flat surface and you get little round drops. If you take that same blood and you flick your finger at your brother, you know, <laughs> that's what you do, you know, I have two boys. You know. Then you get long, skinny, elongated stains, right? Because that's impact pattern, his striking at an angle. And so that's blood, pain, blood stain pattern analysis. So as a parent, you're gonna do this as well. Because you're going to be walking to the bathroom going, which one of you did this? Um, so basically, we'll take multiple droplets of blood, and somewhere, we're going we're gonna to mark each drop, calculate the angle, we're going to pull a string. And somewhere those strings are going to come together. And when the strings come together, we call that the area of convergence. And that tells me where my person was located at the time they were impacted. So if I have three areas of convergence, how many times was my person struck? Three times. Three times. No. It's a trick question. That's what everybody says. Generally, we'll say plus one because uh, on an impact spatter, on the first impact, you're not bleeding. So if I have a, an axe handle or a baseball bat um, and you know, I strike somebody with it, the first blow makes the blood begin to flow. Then the second and subsequent impacts cause the blood to impact spatter, and then you'll start seeing that. So if I get multiple impacts, Generally, we'll say it's at least one more. It could be two or three more, depending on how hard they were hit initially and did they start to bleed. So a blunt force trauma, it gives us an idea of how many times an individual or victim may have been impacted, which is something that we'll get asked on the stand. Uh, because at a trial, the attorney might say, well, how many times did the, de the defendant hit the, the victim? And the defendant may say, oh, I was just defending myself. I hit him one time. And I'm like, well, I can show you five individual hits, you know, based on the impact spatter. So it can be very helpful for us in the crime team um, documentation. So this is kind of what strings look like. You see the area of pooled blood here. So our victim was lying on the floor. And this area where these strings come together, there's also a second area back here. So I have two areas where impacts work. So if you measure from the floor up, these impacts, um, the, the, the back impact is, if I remember, this one was about 14 inches off the floor, and this one was like 9 or 10 inches off the floor. So if the, if the suspect says, he was coming at me with a knife, so I hit him to defend myself. Okay, does that make sense? No. Yeah. My argument's going to be, well, if you hit him the first time and you knocked him down, okay, I'm okay with that. But then you hit him again when he was 10 inches off the floor, then you hit him again, you know, hit him at 14, you hit him at 10. If you continue to keep striking the person, at that point it's hard to argue that, that there is a continued threat. Uh, the law in the United States, and again, I don't know how it works here, is once the person is no longer a threat, you're no longer justified in using force. So if you're defending yourself, you can defend yourself, 
But, you know, if, if Dommy's attacking me and I pull out my gun, he turns and runs, I can't, bam, you know, got him. You know, because it's hard for me to say he's still a threat when he was running away. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, we, we, we find that's the story later. Oh, I was defending myself, you know. We also don't allow use of force to defend property. Uh, so if Dommy's taking my TV and running across my front yard, I can't, you know, do that. No, I'll get my TV back. Yeah, I don't want to do that. We actually had a case, I think it was late last year. Um, this was the scene that I had to get split up and work half of it by myself and my partner worked another half. Um, so we have a person who is dead in a, tr in a truck that hit a tree going 60 plus miles an hour. And then at a gas station half a mile down the road, we have shell casings. And so the story ended up being that at a gas station, a guy was getting gas in his truck and he went over to help someone else. And then a third guy jumped in and stole his truck and started to drive away. So just like Jeff was saying, the owner of the truck started shooting at his own truck. He ended up hopping into the back of the truck in the bed of it. And then they both crashed and the guy who stole the truck ended up dying, but not from a gunshot wound. But the owner ended up jumping out of the truck, even though he was injured and his blood was still in the truck. And he ended up running away. We found him a few days later, but he was still charged with murder with that. Yeah, so you get some crazy things that go on. And that's what I love about the forensic side of things. We can just tell you this is what the evidence says, and then they can argue about why they were jumping in a truck and shooting at a guy down the line. All right, so blood stain pattern. Um, if we're looking at the blood pattern in this particular scene, this is my expert, so I know you'll know all the answers. But <laughs> um, so if I'm going to take a sample for DNA, where am I going to sample my blood from? In the head. In the head, okay. I don't need to take a sample from the head, and the reason is this. They're going to do that in autopsy. They're going to take a sample from the person so we know. Um, if he has a hole in his head and there's red stuff running out of it and his blood, I'm pretty confident it's his. Um, and I'm not going to have to get a test. Well, you, you laugh. I mean, I've been asked that on the stand. I mean, lawyers are crazy. Any law students in here? Want to fit you? Okay, yeah, there you go. Yeah. I fit my lawyer. People. Lawyers love to ask the craziest questions in a world, right? But yeah, I had a lawyer object to once. I had a, a victim shot in the head and it was blood on the pillow. And I was testifying about the blood. And the defense attorney objected and said, did you test it? I said, well, no, I didn't test it. Well, can you immediately look at any substance and tell what it is? I said, well, no. So um, they made what's called a motion in limine. It's a, um, it, it's a legal maneuver. And they made a motion to the judge that said, I can't use the word blood to refer to that stain because I didn't test it. And we don't have a chemical test to tell us what it is. And so the judge granted her motion. So I couldn't say blood when I talked about it. I could say the red brown stain on the pillow next to the victim's head. So when the prosecutor gets up and they call redirect, the prosecutor looked at me and he says, Agent Brandon, why didn't you test the red brown stain? And I said, well, he had a hole in his head and red stuff was running out of it. I was pretty sure that it was blood and that it was his. I didn't think I needed a test to tell me that. And the jury started to laugh, you know, because they were like, that makes sense, you know. But yeah, that's lawyers, so, you know. But they pay you a lot of money to ask those kind of questions, so I understand. Right. So, yeah. So in this case, um, we, I don't have to test him because the, the lab's going to get a DNA sample from him, and they're going to create a profile. Um, I, I want to get a sample here. Now, more than likely, this is his blood, right? There's a hole right here, and it's running out. So, yeah, but I'm going to go ahead and collect a sample. My question is, how does this get here? Does that look odd? Yeah. Yeah. And so when I'm looking at it, I look at that and say, okay, what is, whoops. Back my wrong button. All right, so I want to look at this area. Now, this call came in to me as an officer involved shooting. Officer stops this car, uh, walks up to talk to the driver. The driver pulls a gun and shoots at the officer. Uh, the report that I got was that the officer is not hit. He falls down. Officer gets up, draws his weapon, returns fire, and in doing so, shoots this. So this is an entrance from the officer's gun. So he shoots this suspect and kills him. But there's a female passenger in the car, and she is also hit in the, in the shooting. She's been shot in her left hand. So she's been transported to the hospital when I get there. So we're working the scene based on the information that the officer shot the suspect, that the officer shot the, the, 
bystander inadvertently. Um, so that's the information that we get. Now, when I teach police officers, I like to use this case because it teaches us a very valuable principle that we need to look at. Um, we send an officer to the hospital to interview the lady who's been shot. She's alive, so we want to get her statement. Tell me what happened. She's a witness, right? She was there. And so her statement is, I was breaking up with him. He pulled out a gun and said, if I can't have you, nobody's going to have you, and was getting ready to shoot her when the police officer just happened to drive up and pull the car over. Um, so he tells her, don't say anything. He shoots at the officer. He then turns and puts the gun to her head. She reaches up with her left hand and grabs the muzzle of the gun and pulls it away. And in doing so, he fires a shot through her left hand. And then immediately the officer starts to return fire through the back of the car, shooting and killing him. So the officer shoots the suspect. The suspect shot the victim prior to being shot by the officer. The only reason that I know that is because we are sharing information which is a critically important part of our job. As a crime scene investigator, I need to know what the detective that's doing the interview knows. And if they're giving me good information, that detective needs to know what I know. So we have to share information back and forth so we're both drawing the right conclusions based on the evidence that we're looking at. Um, and once again, don't you know, follow the evidence. We don't want to make assumptions. You know, I can look at this and tell you this doesn't look right to me, and if, in fact, if I take a sample, that's going to be our female victim's blood. This is going to be our male suspect's blood. Um, and so that's just how that would work out. But it's important that we have the rest of the story. So we don't want to just take one isolated piece of evidence. We want to look at what we call the totality of the circumstance, the big term we use a lot in our world. This is my uh, deer hunting guy with his wife. I wanted to illustrate the area. So according to what he tells me, he's over here in this area. His wife is over here. He says, bring me my gun. She gets out and trips over this limb and falls and the gun shoots her. That's his story. But it's an indeterminate range gunshot wound. It's not a press contact. There's lots of issues with that. Um, but this is an illustration. Of, and then the other thing about deer hunting too, and I'm not a deer hunter, but I asked him, I said, if your wife's in the truck with the gun and you see the deer and you say, bring me my gun, and you say it loud enough that she can hear you from this location, isn't the deer gonna run away? And he says, no. Yeah. So, uh, well, they have some hearing impaired deer in North Georgia if you want to come hunt. Apparently, every time I've seen a deer, you make any sound and they run. Uh, so a little odd. All right. So when we get to the end of our crime scene, one of the questions we want to ask ourselves is: Have I gone far enough in the search for evidence? Have I documented all the essential things and made no assumptions as maybe proved law wrong at a later time? That's the question that I have to ask before I walk away from my crime scene. So like, how far do I go with this? Did I get everything that I need to get? And oftentimes, I'm gonna to talk to another crime scene specialist, or I'm gonna to talk to the detective. Before I leave the scene, I'm gonna call and go, hey, I'm done, I think. Let me tell you what I've got, and then you tell me, because we wanna get our heads together. We don't wanna miss something. We wanna make sure, because I don't get to go back and do this crime scene again later. I get one shot to get it right. So it's very important that we do that. So that's kind of where we are in the scheme of things from crime scene is have I done all the things I need to do to draw all the information I need together to be able to say this is a reasonable explanation for what happened. Um, and that's kind of where we're at now. So why did I get on a plane and fly halfway around the world to talk to you about that? Um, so what we're going to do is you know, we do a couple of different seminars or lectures or whatever the appropriate term is while we're here. So Thursday night, we're going to follow up on this um, as we approach Easter. And I know uh, they tell me that this is mostly a Catholic country. So I'm assuming everybody's familiar with Easter um, in, 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 in Croatia, right? So as we approach Easter, uh, there's a uh, what I think is probably the biggest crime scene that, that's ever existed. And we're going to talk about that. So we have to talk about, you know, we, we touched on earlier manners of death. Everybody who dies dies in one of these four manners. Does anybody agree with that? Suicide, homicide, accidental, natural. And then there's another one that they'll use sometimes they call undetermined. I don't like to call that a manner of death. That means we don't know. Sometimes we'll find a skeleton out in the woods and it's completely skeletonized. There's no evidence and we don't know how that person died. Um, but generally speaking, your death will you know, happen in one of those four ways. So that's manner of death. That's different than cause of death. Cause of death is going to be specific. Cause of death is blunt trauma, gunshot wound, heart attack, cancer, drug overdose. Those are very specific things um, that can 
that can apply to any manner of death. So if I asked you, if you shoot another person and they die, what manner, what, what manner of death is that? Homicide. Homicide. Everybody did that, right? Does that mean you have to go to jail? No. Why? Depends on the circumstances. Depends on the circumstances, right? So the circumstances of that act make a difference. So manner of death has nothing to do with the law and crime. It just has to do with this is a determination of how this person died. Suicide means you died in your own hand. You, homicide means you died as a result of somebody else's actions. Accidental is an accident. And then natural is natural causes, you know, heart attack, disease, those types of things. So we start, sometimes people confuse that. They confuse homicide and murder. Homicide and murder are not the same thing. Uh, murder is a, at least in the United States, murder is a, um, a criminal act where homicide is a man of death. Is that the same here? Is that how it works for you guys? Um, so we want to differentiate those. So again, as we approach the Easter season, um, oops, I said it wrong every time. All right, so the Easter homicide. There was this guy named Jesus, right? Um, and can we all agree that Jesus died as a result of somebody else's actions? Is that a fair assumption? Yes. He was crucified by the Romans. Okay. So, manner of death would be homicide, right? Would you agree with that? Okay. So, if we take the crime scene and the homicide investigative techniques and we apply them to the varying theories about what happened to the body, where did it go? Right? We have an empty tomb. What happened to the body? We have to look at what is our reasonable explanation? What can we draw from that? And we're going to talk about that on Thursday at the Palace Hotel. So if you guys want to come Thursday and dig down a little deeper into that, we're going to talk about motives and what are the different motives and why people do things and that kind of stuff. That's what we're going to do Thursday. Tonight, we have a limited amount of time. Um, we're going to go eat pizza. Right? <laughs> that's what everybody's here for, right? Um, so I'm happy to answer questions, but a lot of times people don't want to sit here and shout, shout questions back and forth. So I, I'm assuming at this point we're, we're about ready to wrap up. Is that